Welcome to a Brit in Poland. In this week's video, I want to show you Vilanov Palace. This was built in 1696 for King Jan Sobieski III and is one of the, let's say, oldest parts of Warsaw because it wasn't destroyed during the Second World War like most of the places were. And it's one of like Poland's most preserved and special, let's say, monuments, or buildings, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to show you around, we're going to talk about the history, and I hope you enjoy. Dzień dobry and welcome to A Brit in Poland. This channel is going to bring you everything you need to know about Poland. I am exploring the country, bringing you the history, trying to tell you about the culture and show you what it is really like to live here. So feel free to check out my other media, Instagram, Facebook, and I will share links to those in the comments. I also have a website, www.britinpoland.com, where I collate my videos for easy to view manner. Also, you are welcome to contribute to my efforts through Patronite or Patreon, and all descriptions are available below the video. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and please come back for more by subscribing, liking, or commenting. Thank you very much. So Vilanov Palace is located in the kind of far south of Warsaw. Getting there is perhaps not the easiest. You can get an Uber for about 30 zloty, or you can take a bus, which will probably take about 45 minutes from the center. The palace itself is incredibly beautiful, uh, very well restored. And I hope this video covers maybe not everything, you can learn about the palace. I would sincerely recommend you go there and take a tour to learn more, but hopefully it should cover enough to quench your interest because this place is a must see if you're going to Warsaw, certainly. So as established in the introduction, the palace was originally built uh, by Jan Sobieski and Jan Sobieski uh, III uh, was elected King of Poland in 1674. Before this, he was known to travel Western Europe and the Ottoman Empire as a youth. He was fluent in Latin, French and other languages. Uh, he led the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Holy Roman Empire forces to victory against the Ottoman Empire in Vienna, 1683 and had interests in science, geography, cartography, and astronomy. So he was a very notable king. And a lot of what you see in this palace is down to his success or the wealth of the subsequent owners of the palace. So the Chinese room and the hunting rooms are basically yeah, full of trophies from the kind of 19th century occupation of the palace. And after Sobieski, uh, the palace was owned by the Kartorowski family, the Lubomirski family, and the Potocki family. So very uh, wealthy and famous families in Poland. The, um, the land for the palace was actually bought in 1677, and it was originally called Milanov, changed to Vilanov. And it was built to be far enough from the royal castle to avoid the noise and the crowds, but close enough to maintain a strong level of rule. So it was more of a, I'd say, a summer house for King Sobieski, but it was um, a wonderful place uh, that saw much wonder over the years. And it was built in like an Italian representative slash Baroque style. And around it was a farm and brewery used to feed the extended family and also any guests to the villa. And after 1683, the Battle of Vienna, the manor house was expanded and there were many artists inspired by the acts of Sobieski and they created many paintings and sculptures uh, to celebrate his time. The decorations on the southern side of the palace were dedicated to the king, while the northern side were the virtues of his wife, Maria Kazimir. 
And a lot of the, the rooms you're seeing now are kind of like reception rooms, libraries, galleries. Uh, this particular sculpture is uh, Sobieski in his battle against the Ottoman Empire. And you see these amazing kind of frescoes and murals, uh, sculptures dotted throughout the palace. I mean, it really does compare to the royal castle in terms of the, the beauty of what you can see inside. Um, the palace was expanded in the 18th century uh, by Alexander and Constanti, who were Sobieski's sons. And a large wing was added to the Southern Hall by Elzebieta uh, Sienievska, who purchased the property in 1720. Um, Isabella Lubomirska added a guardhouse and a kitchen and a bath in the uh, kind of late 18th century. And in the 19th century, uh, a museum was opened by Stanislav Kostka Potsotsky. Um, Vilanov was actually incorporated only into Warsaw in 1951. But yes, so now we get to like the really beautiful room. So the king's antechamber, which was used as kind of like a, a guest room uh, while people were waiting to see the king. And you have to imagine it must have been fairly intimidating uh, to see all of these kind of symbols uh, from mythology. You know, they really kind of put his power up with the gods, you could say. Um, you know, uh, tribute to the Battle of Vienna there. The Chinese cabinet, which uh, yeah, it also contained the king's wardrobe. You've got, of course, the king's bedroom, which as well as serving as a bedroom, he would also have private meetings up here. The uh, Dutch cabinet was used primarily as like a reception room. Look how wonderfully decorated these rooms are. I tell you, they're incredible. And yes, you just see these murals, my God. Like seriously, you have to walk around here and you could spend hours just staring at the ceiling um, in a lot of these rooms. So the palace itself is contained within a nature reserve known as the Morrison Park. And it's next to the Vilanovskia Lake, which was once an arm of the Vistula River. And sorry, we're just going from room to room here. The alfresco cabinet is cool. It's full of these illusionist paintings. Uh, I think it was kind of remodeled a little bit, but it's to give you the impression you're outside, basically. <laughs> you know, all these cabinets full of paintings and, yeah, wonderful sculptures. The Grand Vestibule, uh, which was used as like a, a dining slash banquet hall. And, I mean, look at some of the artifacts that have been preserved here, primarily from the kind of 19th century but still very beautiful. We have the you know, Cabinet of Antiquities, which is full of kind of Greek and uh, Egyptian kind of artifacts. You have a number of these painting galleries, um, you know, with obviously religious paintings, but paintings of the king. Uh, the Fiance Cabinet, which is made of 2,000 tiles, which were made in Amsterdam in 1690. You have the Quiet Room, and this room contained, the decoration it actually goes back to Sobieski's time, so it is not so 19th century. So we're going to show you the outside of the palace now. And you've got the Rose Garden. And of course, this has been remodeled uh, a few times over the years. You know, it's full of wonderful fountains, beautiful flowers. And, you know, it was a primary place for, you know, the king to relax and in the summer, I tell you, it is absolutely beautiful. Like, uh, really, like, the best times to visit this palace would probably be from, I'd say, like, May to August to really get the uh, the most of the, the beauty. You have the Baroque Garden, uh, which is, like, the, the back of the palace. And again, redesigned a few times. And there are a number of kind of symbols of power kind of hidden here. 
uh, to kind of really like illustrate the king's wealth and influence over, well, the Poland Lithuanian Commonwealth and uh, the wider world. He was a very famous king in his time and known by many nations. So it's, yeah, I will have to talk about Polish kings in more detail. The, the pumping house, which would have uh, been used for powering the many fountains that used to be uh, present in the gardens, and now just stands as this kind of rather crazy gothic room. You can hire boats and kayaks uh, to travel on the Villanovskia Lake, and you can see it's a very tranquil setting. It must have been very, very peaceful to live here. Certainly when you visit, you have so much peace. Uh, you have this whole kind of sculpture, landscape, garden, and, you know, dotted throughout are all these different statues, all these different monuments uh, to various gods and kings, and, you know, really paint that picture of wealth, success, and power. I believe that was Heracles there. Uh, this is a, yeah, an altar to uh, the Battle of Vienna. Uh, this is another lovely water space and you can see written on there is Pototskich I wasn't sure what this building was it was kind of on the outskirts of the garden and I, the, the incredible guidebook I bought from the uh, the museum didn't quite cover that but you have all these wonderful touches like this Chinese gazebo and you can walk around uh, this area in the summer. In the winter, this is closed, and we'll go on to that. So the here's the orangery, um, which was moved, I believe. And you have this whole series of gardens uh, dotted around the palace. So this one is the uh, the northern garden. And again, pure beauty, just everywhere. <laughs> Uh, that's a, a church which you can sort of see when you enter the palace. And here, coming up, we have uh, something from the... Um, uh, sorry, we're still looking around the Northern Garden. This looks so different in winter, and you will see that very shortly. But like, yeah, truly, truly beautiful area. Now, this is a mausoleum. Uh, in the Gothic style, to Stanislav Koska, uh, Panetovsky, and his wife, Alexandra Potovska, who were, like, let's say, the, the final kind of royal owners of the palace. Now, during the winter, you may think, okay, what's the point of coming here? And the reason you would come here in the winter, and in fact, I've been here many winters, is because of the light garden. So the light garden, it goes up kind of towards the, I think, the end of October and is normally in place until kind of uh, about February sort of time. And it's kind of representative of providing something for people to do during the very cold winter months in Poland. And every year, uh, the theme changes. Uh, so when I went uh, last year, the theme was very much centred around Sobieski and his interests. So he was very interested in mythology. So you had this whole section dedicated to the uh, the Greek gods, basically. You know, Hephaestus there. You have the, you know, like the uh, fountain you saw earlier, maybe. You'll recognize it here. It's completely transformed. Uh, here's an astrolabe uh, to kind of, you know, commemorate his, his love of astronomy. And you see, like, the whole of the palace garden is completely redone. And here's a very interesting representation of the planets. And a number of these displays are interactive, so you can actually, you know, move them around, uh, press certain buttons to light different bits up. This is like a musical fountain, uh, which is, you know, great fun to just watch for a few minutes as the, the light, different lights cascade. And to either side of this fountain, you have, again, this, you know, lovely light show uh, going to the music. And normally the music tends to be kind of Chopin or something of that kind of era. And then you have the Rose Garden transformed into all of these beautiful 
uh, roses of, uh, yeah, wonderful colors. And in addition to that, you know, you have the fountains again, uh, just lovely and decorated. And you see these wonderful patterns of light on the main facade of the palace, which seem to work about every half hour. So I really recommend going to Villanov Palace. You know, once you get there, it's going to be about 20 or 30 zloty, I think, for the museum, and about 30 or 40 zloty uh, for the light garden during the winter. So it really is worth visiting. But thank you very much for watching. Much more to come about Poland. So, do zobaczenia, and take care. <laughs>